All right. Well, be sure to see Kevin's group next door. We'd be very, very happy to have you visit them. Another round of applause for Kevin Harrington. But wait, there's more. This next person who I'm about to introduce, I've gotten to know fairly well over the past few years. He's been uh, an amazing and frequent presenter at fee seminars and fee workshops. You know, I mentioned Praxis earlier. Praxis, uh, this, our next speaker is the co-founder and the director of education for Praxis. And I think he's going to blow your socks off. He's consistently rated. I hope I'm not talking him up too much as one of our highest rated speakers at our events. I want to introduce to you T.K. Coleman. How's everybody doing tonight? Are we excited about getting out there and creating a free society? Are we excited about getting out there and changing the world? Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm not going to talk with you about how cool entrepreneurship is, because I think you already know that. I think you've heard a lot about that. You just heard a great talk that should have inspired you to see entrepreneurship as the sexy, sensational thing that it actually is. I'm also not going to paint a picture of how pretty the world would look if it were free. I want to challenge you today, because I'm not interested in being just another cheerleader for a society in which everybody can be free. I'm interested in empowering specific individuals who can figure out ways to be free in any kind of society. And that's the thing that we lack. We've got enough cheerleaders. We've got enough people who say, oh man, a free society would be awesome. But those same people lack the vocabulary to go out into a world that often opposes that freedom and actually realize those ideals. I want to begin with the story the night before I got on the plane to come here, my wife and I watched an episode of a television show that Isaac recommended to me called Fringe. How many of you have heard of the show Fringe? All right, so we watched the episode, and the name of this episode was called Bad Dreams. And uh, this show chronicles the life of an FBI agent. Her name is Agent Olivia Donham. And she is assigned to cases that, you know, border on the conspiratorial, the paranormal, the kinds of things that we can't explain away or resolve you know, through conventional means. So she falls asleep one night with the television set on, and she has a dream. And in this dream, someone gets murdered. She wakes up, and she sees on her television screen the image of the very person that was murdered in her dream. And then the news reporter begins to describe the gruesome details of this murder, and they correspond exactly to what she saw in that dream. And at first, she thinks this is just coincidence. She tells a friend about it, and her friend says it's just a combination of stress and sleeplessness, and she probably shouldn't make too big of a deal out of it. So she has another dream, and that dream also comes true. Then she has another dream, and that dream also comes true. And she begins to realize that something's going on here, that these dreams have meaning, that perhaps the universe is speaking to or through her via these dreams. And so she does what we all do when we have dreams that provoke us. She sought out external validation and support. She goes to the FBI and she says, I need your resources, I need your support, I'm having these dreams, these dreams are coming true, and if you can invest in me, I can go out there and I can do something about it. And they responded to her in the same way the world responds to you when you talk about your dreams. They said, you need a little bit more sleep. And so they didn't give her the support. And so she starts to get a little stressed out, a little paranoid. And then she has a radical idea, an idea that takes far more imagination than anything that she saw in her dreams. And that idea was more important than trying to convince other people to validate and support my dreams is doing whatever is within the realm of my power to do to save one human life. And so she does something crazy she steps outside of the system, the permission-based system, and she gets out there and she breaks the rules and she tries to save a life even though it puts her at great risk and she succeeds. She actually saves one life. And then and only then, the FBI decides that they will put their full support behind her 
and she's able to go on to solve more crimes. That's the funny thing about support. You know, there's a myth in the startup world that the way to get people to invest in you is to come up with some really awesome creative idea that nobody's ever had before. But creative ideas, especially ideas about how to create a freer world, are a dime a dozen. Everybody has them. Everybody thinks they have them. And no one gives a damn because there's no one that will ever invest in your idea. The only thing that people ever invest in is momentum, the demonstrated ability to get things done. We live in a world where there are very few guarantees, but there is one guarantee I believe in, and that is this. True power belongs to those who are willing to act in the absence of guarantees. Like Agent Dunham, we all have dreams. Dreams of a freer society on a collective level, dreams of living more freely on an individual level, dreams that provoke us, dreams that disturb us. But like Agent Dunham, we often go about in a world that looks at those dreams as crazy, or we deal with people who have a hard time making sense out of those dreams. And like Agent Dunham, we have to figure out a way to create results in the absence of support. How do we do that? Earlier today, my colleagues, Isaac Morehouse, Derek McGill, they did a panel discussion with me called Breaking the Mole. We talked about praxis and how we work with young people to facilitate educational experiences where we show them how to translate their dreams into goals and those goals into value creation based results. And one of the questions that came up in the Q&A was, you know, I, I like this philosophy, I like what you guys are talking about, but nobody else in society thinks that way. And that does seem to be a problem, right? You know, we're kind of like in an ideological vacuum. Everybody here is, you know, resonating with the whole anything peaceful idea. You know, everybody kind of agrees with one another about, you know, the awesomeness of freedom and the coolness of entrepreneurship. But that's not where the problem lies, right? When you go out into the real world, you find most people oppose these kinds of ideas. I have people remind me this of, of this all the time, by the way. I'm always blogging about optimism and the power of creativity, and there are always people enlightening me about the fact that, you know, TK, that's really nice, that's really cute, Mr. Wannabe Tony Robbins, but the reality is there's political corruption in the world. And I guess these people think that someday I'm gonna hear about some political scandal that's gonna make me go, oh, what the hell am I doing trying to change the world? I, I guess things are so bad, I should probably go sit in the corner and just be depressed and do nothing. But there is a problem, right? There is a lot of opposition in the world. So how do we create results in that world? How do we get things done? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to step back and we have to look at the world's opposition in an unconventional way. We often look at it as evidence that our dreams are meaningless or that our dreams are powerless. But we actually have to look at that as the very basis of what makes us valuable. One of the things that we talked about in our, at our panel is that if everyone saw the world the way you did, what would be the need for you? You know, there's a story that I heard, I'm not even sure if it's true, but just get the message out of it. Please don't be one of those cats who come up to me later like, technically, that never happened. I don't even care if it happened or not. The story is a mere vehicle. It's a useful fiction, all right? So the story is that um, when, when they had a ceremony um, after having built the Epcot Center, uh, some person spoke and said, what an amazing day. I wish Walt Disney were here to see this. And his wife stands up and says, I have to correct you. My husband saw this before any of us did. And the idea there is that a true dreamer is someone that sees changes before other people find those changes to be believable. If everybody could easily get on board with your vision for a better world, for a freer society, then we would no longer need you. So that very thing that is the source of your anguish is also the source of your value. But here's the most important thing. There's a basic concept in physics called inertia. Anybody know what inertia is? What's inertia? Somebody on the front row, tell me. Uh, just continuing the motion they have or position they have. Right. Inertia is typically uh, understood in terms of tendencies, right? An object at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. An object in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Now, inertia isn't a concept that I made up. It's not a concept that Oprah made up. 
It's a real thing, right? This is physics that we're talking about. So that means the world is inherently resistant to change. So to have an intellectually honest conversation about changing the world means that we need to be honest about facing resistance as a necessary part of that. So when people point out that the world will resist our efforts to change it, they are simply saying something about the nature of change. They are not giving you an argument that says you can't change the world, they're just simply letting you know that this is what change is. This is what change, this is what change takes. So when you try to make things happen, you will experience kickback from the world that says, I'm not gonna make this easy on you. Because in order to overcome inertia, you have to do more than just apply force, you have to apply a greater amount of force than whatever is opposing you, whatever is sustaining the status quo. Now, I want you to think about your ideas of what this world needs. And I want to challenge you to make a commitment. Because when you leave here, you're going to lose out on this beautiful experience that you're now having, which is the opportunity to have coffee and cool conversation with interesting people who think like you. You're going to go out into a world that's going to beat you up and make you look crazy and make you feel crazy. And I don't want you to lose all the valuable inspiration that you're getting from this conference. So I want to challenge you to make a decision. I want to challenge you to commit before you leave here to building, starting, launching, or creating one thing that will make the world freer. And when I say make the world freer, I really mean you. Because you can't change the world, but you can change you. And a part of the world changes with you. And when I say decision, I don't mean discovery. I don't mean think about what the right answer is and try really hard to discover it, asking 30 different people for advice. I mean, make a decision. I mean, recognize that you have the power to make things up, that you have the power to invent reality and decide what you're going to create. Because the force that changes the world, it's not dreams, it's the power of choice. One of the things that Kevin talked about up here was building a dream team. And I agree with that. I think that's immensely valuable. You gotta build a dream team. But I wanna take that a little bit further. I wanna challenge you to build a decision team. I wanna challenge you to surround yourself with people that won't let you get away with talking shit about creating a freer world, but who will challenge you to do shit until shit gets done. Because at the end of the day, it's not dreams that come true, it's only decisions that do. Thank you. Woo!